Hello, I'm Dan, and this is Dan Explains. If you've ever watched a sci-fi space series or movie, you probably have noticed that the spaceships all share something in common. They all have artificial gravity. That's, of course, more to do with production costs than anything else, but it does make it seem like it's pretty important. However, if you look at pretty much all the space endeavors until now, now being September of 2021, artificial gravity seems to be like a pretty low priority. However, as people start to try and live and work in space, the importance of artificial gravity will grow. Most forms of artificial gravity we can accomplish come with some weird effects. What are they and how would they affect us? Let me explain. So I'd like to explain why we float in space at all. Well, the thing is, you don't. People on the International Space Station, for instance, appear to float because they're in free fall. Oftentimes, you hear someone describe it as falling, but they're just moving so fast that they miss the Earth. I think a more intuitive way to look at it is the centrifugal force generated by spinning something. Okay. It's actually called a fictitious force, but for simplicity, I'm just going to say it's a force. You can imagine the space station is attached to the center of the Earth by a string, and it's being spun around the Earth to keep it in orbit. However, the string is actually Earth's gravity, and it's perfectly balanced with the centrifugal force, creating an apparent weightlessness. This, of course, is hard to simulate here on Earth which is why most sci-fi movies and series just don't try. They come up with some form of artificial gravity. You either need to have a bunch of equipment in a big studio or fantastic computer-generated graphics. Well, there's one other way. The movie Apollo 13, filmed inside of a plane, used to train NASA astronauts. The plane simulates zero gravity by flying in arcs which follow the same trajectory as you would if you were actually in free fall. So, the actors in the movie are actually floating. That's not a cheap way to film a movie, as you can probably imagine. You might wonder why NASA never bothered with some form of artificial gravity with the space station. It would make working on the station easier. However, the near-zero gravity environment of the space station is kind of the point. The space station wasn't built because having a laboratory in space is cool. It was built so experiments could be performed in zero G. So yeah, that makes having artificial gravity a hindrance rather than a good thing. However, as people start going to space for more reasons than just performing experiments in zero G or just because zero G is fun, artificial gravity will be more important. There are two ways of generating artificial gravity that are currently achievable with today's technology, although one is less practical than the other. The first way, which is the type of artificial gravity primarily depicted in the series The Expanse, is continuous acceleration. Basically, you turn your ship's engines on so that it accelerates. The issue with that is, of course, that it uses a lot of propellant to always be accelerating. Huge rockets, which by weight are something like 90% propellant, can only accelerate at a rate over Earth's gravity for 10 minutes or less before they run out of propellant. That's not too practical. However, many of the people in the expanse are supposed to be from the asteroid belt, so they're used to pretty low gravity. So the ship doesn't always have to accelerate at 9.8 meters per second per second which is Earth's gravitational acceleration on the surface. Also, they use fusion for propulsion. If you go with the higher energy density propellants of thermonuclear and nuclear propulsion methods, things get much more practical. According to my own back of the napkin math, and it really is back of the napkin math, if you use something called a nuclear saltwater rocket engine, which was first proposed by Robert Zubrin, somebody you might have heard of on this channel before, 
a ship that has the same propellant to mass ratio as modern rockets could sustain almost 1g of acceleration for almost a month. Not too shabby. But some kind of fusion engine could be 10 times better. So more like a year. If anti-matter propulsion ever becomes a thing, it would be 10 times better than that. So 100 times better than the nuclear saltwater rocket. Instead of having 90% of your ship's mass being propellant, you could bring that down to more like a reasonable 10% and still accelerate a 1G for months. A ship that generated artificial gravity that way would have to be built more like SpaceX's Starship, with the decks on a top-down sort of configuration, rather than NASA's Space Shuttle, where it had the decks in a horizontal configuration relative to the engines. While this might be ideal for spaceships in the future, it would be a very wasteful method for space stations that want to stay relatively stationary in orbit around something like a planet or an asteroid. Also, for now, it's completely unproven and impractical. So, what's the second method of creating artificial gravity? I hinted at it earlier when I mentioned how the space station stays in orbit. Spinning. Basically, you create a space station or a ship shaped like a wheel and you spin it so that the people inside get stuck to the sides. You could also have two ships connected together by a long cable, spinning around each other, like I pointed out in my video using starships to go to Mars. You might ask, why wouldn't you just spin the starships so the people would just stick to the walls inside? The issue with that, however, is that the ships are way too small, with a diameter of only 9 meters. That's because when you generate artificial gravity, Using centrifugal force, you get disorienting effects, which get more and more extreme the smaller your ship is. Too small, and all you've created is a vomit-inducing torture machine. Anyone who's been on one of those carnival rides that spin you around really fast knows what I'm talking about. There have been quite a few experiments done here on Earth that try to find the limits of what humans can tolerate. The issue with these experiments is that we're already in 1G of gravity. So we can't mimic the same rotating environment as you would have in space. Although the United States and the Soviet Union did some higher than earth gravity centrifugal experiments that tried to get close to that in the middle of the 20th century. Most of the experiments have been performed by having people live inside of a spinning room for a while. So you can take the results with a little grain of salt. But what has been found is that to completely eliminate the disorienting effects, you need to be spinning at two rotations per minute or less. So the minimum radius for your spaceship or habitat is 750 feet, or about 230 meters. That's pretty huge and impractical with our current technology. However, they did find that most people could get used to as much as six rotations per minute. At that rate, you'd have a radius of about 25 meters, or about 80 feet. That's almost one-tenth the radius, and much more doable. So, what are these effects anyway? Well, the number one impairing effect, of course, is the feeling of spinning in the inner ear. Also, your head would be closer to the center of the rotation, so your head would feel less gravity than your feet. However, there are other effects that need to be considered when designing a spaceship or habitat, since there are physical phenomena which become more apparent in a rotating environment. One of the things that people would notice right away is that you would feel heavier when you walked in the direction of the rotation and lighter when you walked opposite of the rotation. This is because walking speed is a significant portion of your total speed. A habitat with a radius of about 60 meters, or about 200 feet, would be going around 55 miles an hour, which is about 90 kilometers per hour. Jogging speed could change the gravity you feel by the total amount of gravity you feel when you're walking on the moon, plus or minus, depending on which way you're going. Another effect is while you're walking towards the rotation, it would feel like you were walking uphill. You could minimize these effects by designing your ship to force people to mostly move along the axis of rotation. So, 
perpendicular to the rotation of the ship. However, there is an effect that you have to consider while walking in that direction too. And that's every time you take a step, your momentum will push you in the direction of the rotation a little. This would be even more obvious when you jump. This is because things closer to the center of rotation are moving slower than the things further away. So, when you jump, you get closer to the center of rotation, but your speed stays the same, so you move forward a little when you hop. So, on a 60 meter spaceship, you'd move a few inches towards the direction of rotation when you jump. The opposite happens when you descend from above. You would seem to accelerate away from the direction of rotation. This would have a large effect when considering the use of ladders. If you were climbing a ladder perpendicular to the rotation of the spaceship, you would feel a force trying to pull you off the ladder towards the rotation. The best way to get around this would be to design ladders to be double-sided. So you only climb up a ladder while you're facing the direction of rotation and down a ladder when you're facing away. That way, any force you feel will be pushing you against the ladder rather than trying to pull you off. For stairs, they would always have to ascend away from the direction of rotation. So you don't feel like you're getting pulled down the stairs when you descend. That would be a bad combo. Another reason is when you descend, you would appear to spin in the direction of rotation. And when you ascend, you would spin opposite the rotation. So your feet would be rotating towards the back of the step rather than out away from the step. It would probably be ideal if sink faucets were facing into the direction of rotation. So the water tends to fall toward the back of the sink rather than towards the people using the sink. Showers would probably be ideal if they pointed the other way. So the water falls towards the person using the shower. Considering all that, a small rotating spaceship or habitat probably should not be shaped like a bike tire. It would better have spokes with cylinders perpendicular to the rotation of the ship, maybe with a connecting rim hallway. That way, unless you were traversing between the modules, almost all long walking distances would be perpendicular to the rotation of the ship. There's many more details that we're probably missing that we won't even think to consider until we actually do experiments in space. Even if we achieve efficient fusion or antimatter propulsion, we'll probably be stuck with these sort of artificial gravity side effects for a long time in space habitats. Unless someone can invent the mythical Star Trek gravity plating anyway. If you like this video, please press the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ding the bell to get notified when I post new videos. Also, please support me on Patreon, link in the description. The more people who support me, the more time I can dedicate to making videos like this one. So, until next time, have a great week. Mm -hmm.